We'll now call the first case on this morning's docket. That is case number 107383 in the matter of the adoption of HCH, a minor. Chief Justice, I would like to reserve five minutes uh, for rebuttal. Five minutes is granted. May it please the court, counsel. This is a very simple case. It, the facts are very limited. It was dismissed on a motion to dismiss. But it's not a simple issue. The you know, Briefly, I represent the adoptive, proposed adoptive father, biological father, um, CH, is also represented, the biological mother uh, who has married my client, uh, who's agreed and filed an affidavit for uh, an agreement with the adoption, not just a consent. Uh, I apologize if I refer to certain statutes in incorrectly because I still operate a little bit under uh, the old 38 for before it was moved to 23. So if I misstate one in there, um, because the case was decided initially under the old statutes, but Kansas residents the last 10 years for the minor child and the natural mother and my client, a lifetime Kansas resident. Files for adoption. Child has been in Kansas again for the, over 10 years now. The child is now 15 years of age. Now, who did you say was a lifetime Kansas resident? My client, the, bio, the adoptive father, proposed adoptive father. The child moved here to Kansas with the mother uh, over 10 years ago. Child has not has had limited to no contact with the father, uh, the biological father, during that period of time, during those 10 years. The petition was filed under 59, uh, 2136 under the two years uh, lack of contact and support provision. The nature of the contact, were they in person or the contacts were, uh, as I look in the record, just over the phone? Is that how that, those contacts, and by letter? Uh, there were a few cards and I believe a couple, some phone, a couple phone calls. But nothing, no personal contact? No personal uh, at all. Thank you. The um, petition was filed, an answer was filed, the, the District Court set it for a case management conference. At the case management conference, Judge Helmer indicated he wanted letter briefs from both sides on the jurisdictional, did not grant an evidentiary hearing, wanted to have letter briefs. We submitted both times, both sides timely provided those, and he called us up, said, I want to have a phone conference, and issued his decision. Can I ask a couple of questions about that procedure? Was there ever a formal motion to dismiss filed? There was never a formal motion to dismiss filed. The judge just kind of made it into a motion to dismiss based upon the objection to jurisdiction and the answer. Correct. Okay. And was there a formal request for an evidentiary hearing made by either of the parties? We requested uh, the ability to be heard uh, on it. We, uh, our, the expectation was that we would have an evidentiary hearing. The judge indicated his request at the case management conference, not at the when the decision was entered. My expectation was that the judge said, no, I just want letter briefs. And that's what we followed what the judge wanted for that. But you had already filed an affidavit of the natural of the mother. Correct. And the so verified petition. The verified the, petition. And that is the only verified, the only oh, under oath uh, statements in the record are those filed uh, by my client and my client's spouse. What, what facts would impact our decision? on which court has jurisdiction. I mean, what, what facts did you want to establish at the evidentiary hearing that would have made any difference here? Okay. On the one issue, uh, the first specific issue would be uh, a form nonconvenience finding was found by the district court judge. That was not uh, pled specifically by the natural father, but the court on its own, district court on its own, raised that issue. Uh, the baby boy M case 
there's an evidence you get an evidentiary hearing for that because you cannot put on facts you cannot assume facts like the district court did be it his uh, the father's the natural father's location and the fact that he had the truth was he actually left the state of mississippi for a year and lived in oregon his physical condition uh, his inability to travel as alleged and we which uh, again was stated in pleadings not filed under oath but his condition uh, whether or not that impacted at all his relationship those would have been facts that would have been elicited at an evidentiary hearing uh, on the contact but also on whether or not form non convenience because the other issue the judge helmer uh, dismissed it on was based solely upon his belief that the UCCJA, not the JEA, the JA, uh, warranted its dismissal. Those are the two reasons he stated on the record in his opinion in the transcript. Those are the two reasons contained in the journal entry. If you had been able, or uh, you, you have made the allegation that the uh, natural father left the state of Mississippi for a year. Yes. And so um, on a motion to dismiss standard, do it's your position, as I understand it, that we accept that as true because it's yeah. been alleged. Because it's been alleged. We have all inferences in our favor, and we were not actually allowed. We had issued discovery with that contained. That was not even answered because of the nature of the dismissal by the district court judge. So if we accept that fact as true for purposes of considering a motion to dismiss, is that fact dispositive? of whether or not Miss, the Mississippi court has continuing jurisdiction? Continuing I'd exclusive like jurisdiction? I do not believe it's dispositive. I, I will concede that. I do not believe that it's dispositive on that issue. The, but we, the fact is we were not allowed to have an evidentiary hearing. We, it was a very different procedure followed than I even think that's contained in 59-21-27. Uh, particularly subsection B, which I think is the focus of this entire appeal. I will tell you that. I don't, I don't think you get any further than that because that's the adoption jurisdiction statute and that's the portion dealing with facts or such as these. The venue, I don't think there's any problem with the venue because it was filed in the county where the child had resided, where the father had always resided during his entire life, the, um, my client, the adopted father. Just logistically, as a practical matter, if you want to focus entirely on the adoption uh, statute and the, and the uh, district court in Kansas determines under that statute that there is jurisdiction and uh, grants an adoption to your uh, client and the father files for change of custody in Mississippi, and Mississippi says, okay, yeah, I'm going to grant you uh, custody under the original divorce decree. Where are we? Isn't that exactly why we have the, the uh, uh, Uniform Act? On that two issues, one, the, the uh, Chapter 59, particularly under the statute, provides that a phone call can be made as the rest of that that was not done either and that was requested again that was requested that was not done to avoid that very type of situation if that situation arises though I the uniqueness of this statute if neither party has cited case law from other states involving the UCCJEA and the uniformity as it involves adoption because other states have dealt with it differently and I don't think that with adoptions we're going to have the uniformity that the UCCJEA hoped it would have. It's great for dealing with paternity cases. It's great for dealing with divorces. But from state to state, there is no, there is not consistency uh, between how it's handled. And, the, and again, I was hoping to find a, a statute that was similar to the one we have here, and there is not. I, I, not that I located. Maybe some of your clerks are, are much more adept than I am. But uh, there's none has been cited. Uh, by either. So I think that the problem, you're going to have that problem. With I don't think that we that this fixes any of that problem. But um, the fact is that a call as 50, this as uh, the statute provides for was not made in spite of request. And that would have gone a long way, I think, towards alleviating any potential problem. Because really, there had been no motions filed in those 10 years, actually over 10 years from when she left the state, the mother natural mother left the state, 
and before this adoption was filed. It had been a completely quiet case. When you say <clears throat> a call, you mean a call from the district court judge to the uh, district court judge with jurisdiction in Mississippi? Yes, they had the original jurisdiction. And how would the Mississippi judge know anything about what's going on in Kansas? I mean, I, I, I mean, you're saying a phone call, having sat in that position and receiving a phone call about a particular individual that I may have handled 10 years ago, what, what could possibly be resolved by that phone call? By the time we had the case management conference in this case, and it's, it is cited by the um, uh, appellee, they had filed a motion for citation and contempt in Mississippi. It wasn't pending when we filed the adoption, but us, when we filed, they had a, and so that was before the court down there at that time. And so. Um, so there'd be something to. There was something before it. I, under, I understand exactly the court's concern, but that was there. This was a, a combined um, adoption and termination of parental rights proceeding? Yes. So before the court ever could have undertaken the, the adoption process, it would have first had to terminate this father's parental rights. And is there any distinction to be made in an adoption proceeding between jurisdiction over the termination of the father who's not a Kansas resident's parental rights and the actual adoption process? I don't believe so, Your Honor. Okay. I believe it's unlike a, a sink case where there are the stages and that uh, uh, it's a little bit different. I don't believe there's any, I don't believe there's any distinction between the initial. Well, because, because in order to terminate his parental rights, certain findings have to be made and those don't necessarily pertain to any conduct in Kansas. I mean, they don't have anything to do with the proposed stepfather's ability to, or the proposed father's, the stepfather's ability to parent the child or anything else. The findings would have to do, in this case, with the uh, 592136 uh, <laughs> finding that he had not supported this child in Kansas for two years. He had not had contact with the child here in Kansas for two years. Um, I understand the best interest comes in statutorily. I understand that that's not a determinative factor. Right. But those, the other evidence uh, would be here in Kansas, and, and that would be a finding involving uh, here in Kansas. Okay, thank you. Do we have any further questions of counsel? Thank you, counsel. Thank you. May it please the court. My name is Lee Leglider and I represent the appellee, Chris Haddad. The court today is tasked with a jurisdictional analysis, specifically which of two statutes govern the procedure to determine which state has jurisdiction in this adoption. Uh, that is, it can choose to follow the UCCJEA's edicts, which uh, promote uniformity and encourage principles of comity among the states, or can ignore that in favor of the Kansas Adoption Act, which if followed uh, would put Kansas at odds with the 49 other states that have already adopted and in fact decide their child custody orders um, with an eye towards the UCCJEA. Now there's four reasons I think. Are we really at odds when the adoption statute informs the court that they have to look at uh, whether or not jurisdiction would be substantially in conformance with the Uniform Act? Why does that make it at odds? I, I assume you're discussing uh, 592127B1B? Yes. Well, it, it reverses the... B1A, actually. Okay. Uh, it, we, we still see that it reverses uh, the court which gets to determine uh, which which forum should decide jurisdiction here. In other words, uh, the Kansas adoption statute would have a Kansas trial court make a decision as to whether the Mississippi court has continuing jurisdiction. Uh, the UCCJEA would provide that Mississippi first has to make a determination that it no longer has continuing jurisdiction. And so we switch 
which court makes that determination. Other than flipping the courts, do you think there's any substantive difference? There may not be a substantive difference other than the fact that we're placing the burden on the natural parent now to come to a foreign jurisdiction and defend themselves. In uh, Mississippi, the natural father would continue to receive uh, the benefit of the doubt that we provide natural parents, which is um, that it's their relationship that's being scrutinized under a petition uh, there, for... There's a practical difference. If Mississippi determines it doesn't have jurisdiction, then you've only got one court that's involved here. If Kansas determines Mississippi doesn't have jurisdiction, but Mississippi doesn't agree, then you have a conflict. So there is a difference on which which state makes that determination as a practical matter. Right, and, and of course, as you've stated, there's, there's a practical matter there as well. Um, but and, and so I think what the court has to decide here is the, the principles underlying the UCCJEA, what are they promoting, and, and what's the effect of allowing Kansas to, uh, I guess, proceed in a different manner under its own adoption statute. And so the UCCJEA is promoting principles of uniformity. We've, we've adopted the UCCJEA because 49 other states follow the same consistent application on how we uh, determine matters of child custody across state lines. The uniform statute... Is custody the same as adoption? Custody, of course, is not the same as adoption. However... So that leads to the question, uh, could the appellant here have gone to Mississippi and filed a petition for adoption in Mississippi? They could have filed a motion to terminate Mississippi's um, hearing any further child custody matters and if they couldn't have filed an adoption because the child was was not a uh, the Mississippi wasn't the home state of the child correct I, I believe you're correct under under the specific statute however here the father could continue tomorrow if this court would decide that Kansas doesn't have jurisdiction and actually have a statutory um, right to a petition for adoption under Mississippi's adoption statute. And that's 9317.3, subparagraph 1E, which states that no other state would have jurisdiction or another state has declined on the grounds that this state is more appropriate. So, so here there is a forum. But I would suggest that there's a, an additional practical matter, which is because we're favoring the natural parent in Mississippi, uh, there, there's really nothing to be gained by a challenge to a petition for adoption that's initially filed in Mississippi. I mean, if, if, we, if uh, the petition for adoption is dismissed because Mississippi no longer has jurisdiction and is challenged, then we end up back in Kansas and the natural father is, is fighting the, the fight in a foreign jurisdiction. So there's really no benefit to challenge it once we get to Mississippi. In addition to that, I would suggest that uh, if, if we follow the UCCJEA, uh, we're, we're looking after the best interests of the child. I think we had already discussed the principle of you know, what happens if we have a child custody issue in one state and an adoption matter in another state. Uh, it would seem to me that the best interests of the child uh, would be preserved and, and uh, advocated for if we have one court, one judge, one person deciding uh, the myriad of issues that could arise with a case such as this, which is, uh, you know, the natural father's relationship with his child, uh, the dynamic between the parents and uh, the, the, the children, um, the many issues that would face a family. Uh, if we bifurcate those proceedings and say, well, Kansas can decide the matters of adoption and Mississippi can decide uh, the remaining issues of child custody, then essentially we've got two judges and two courts that are inherently going to decide conflicting issues. Uh, and I, I would challenge the court to find rationale that would support that being in the best interest of the child. Counsel, do you agree with your opponent that the, the facts are undisputed in terms of the contact between the natural father and the child? There was absolutely no contact of any sort for two years, and there was no uh, monetary support for the child for those two years? Uh, the, my understanding is there was some initial uh, support 
uh, following the divorce. During that two-year period? Uh, the two sorry, year which two-year period, period are we? Prior to the filing of the adoption petition? Uh, that's correct. That's there was correct. no contact whatsoever? Well, there, I believe there was some contact in some letters and um, perhaps some phone calls. During uh, but that two-year period? Or do you I, know? I would have to check the record. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know off the top of my head. Do you know if Mississippi has a comparable prov provision? to the Kansas provision on support and contact in the two years preceding the filing of an adoption petition? I believe their adoption statute is uh, similar to Kansas's, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, even if in the alternative this court would decide that in fact Kansas um, should follow its adoption statute as opposed to uh, the language of the UCCJEA, I think we still run into the same issue, which is under 592127B1A, court of this state, Kansas, would have to decide that the court of the other state no longer has continuing jurisdiction or has declined jurisdiction. And so if we look at Mississippi's statute as to continuing jurisdiction, we find that uh, one of the ways Mississippi would lose continuing jurisdiction would be that the child and one natural parent had left the state, as we have here, and a substantial amount of evidence no longer exists in Mississippi. And I would submit to you that if a natural parent remains in that same state, then there shouldn't be a question of whether substantial evidence remains. Again, that's the relationship that's being scrutinized. The natural parent, um, the dynamic between him and the child, and the, the many issues that face a family, uh, will be under scrutiny. And I think to suggest that we don't have substantial evidence remaining in Mississippi would, would probably be to ignore the, the reality of the situation. Uh, and so you can look to the alternative in Mississippi, which states that uh, the child and both the natural parents have left the state. And of course, that's not what we have here, which leaves us with 592127B1B, in which the court of the other state does not have jurisdiction for adoption substantially in conformity with A1 through 4. Now, of course, uh, there's, there's kind of a vague reference here to A1 through 4 um, because the subsection A of 5921-27 doesn't have subsection 1 through 4. Um, and so I, I struggle to provide you with an explanation of what that could be referencing. My research indicates that uh, before the Kansas adoption statute was amended, in 2000, there was an A1 through 4, um, but it specifically dealt with agency uh, adoptions and venue. Uh, and so I, I, you know, whether it still refers to that section, I don't know. Um, if it's an erroneous section, I'm not sure. Uh, if it refers to an adoption statute substantially in conformity with Kansas's adoption statute, I think we have that in Mississippi. And I think we've already discussed that uh, Mr. Martin could go tomorrow uh, to Mississippi, having had a petition for adoption dismissed in a Kansas court and filed under subparagraph 1E of Mississippi's adoption statute. But, but of course, that's in the alternative. Um, it would be the position of the appellee that the UCCJEA is, in fact, the correct procedure to follow. Uniform laws are only as good as um, their ability to remain uniform. If Kansas begins chipping away at the UCCJEA and determines that its own adoption statute can be Kansas's specific authority to determine whether jurisdiction exists in Kansas when there's an existing child custody order in another state, uh, then we break down that consistency. We, we decrease the uniformity. Is that a call for the legislature, though? They they wrote the Kansas Adoption Jurisdiction Statute without telling us to do all to 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 look back over to the other statute. They they appear to have made it uh, somewhat self-contained, other than those references to in conformance with or in substantially conforming. And so, do why do we look beyond the language they they used in fifty nine twenty one twenty seven? Well, a couple of reasons, I think. And the first is, as you've already indicated, that they've, they've made a point that the UCCJEA matters in adoption proceedings. And it's because adoption is the most extreme form of custody. 
I mean, we're talking about substantially altering a potential child custody order that already exists. And so we can't necessarily ignore a child custody order when we're talking about an adoption proceeding. It's just too difficult to have the two be decided in separate states. Uh, and so I would, I would suggest to you that uh, you know, principles of comity, uh, they don't compel, uh, but they, they most assuredly fail if, if we aren't complying. I don't think Kansas should be the first state to uh, attempt to test otherwise. And for those reasons, uh, if the court no longer has questions for me, I would uh, request that it affirm the lower court's decisions. Any further questions of counsel? Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Your five minutes for rebuttal. In specifically addressing certain issues that were discussed, the uh, GM cannot go to Mississippi and file a motion in a 1998 divorce case that he's not a party in. The party is his wife, not him. So he would not have the ability to go to Mississippi and file there. He would also not have the ability to go to Mississippi and file for an adoption. He would have to be a resident of six months in Mississippi under their code 93173 in order to file. The child would have to be a resident of Mississippi. So he would have to leave the state of Kansas where he has always resided to move down there for six months in the hopes that the court down there would grant him an adoption and move the child from where she has resided for the past 10 plus years to Mississippi in the hopes the court down there would grant an adoption under the reading um, that is proposed by the appellee. We have a progression procedurally from a lower court with no evidentiary hearing, no call to a Mississippi judge, raising on its own the form of nonconvenience and the UCCJA reliance to the Court of Appeals decision, which goes through the history and the language and then gets to the last paragraph and, basic, and where the meat of the decision is. And in those five sentences, discusses that it believes that the UCCJEA supersedes even the, the statute and noting the conflict between the statutes, but supersedes 59, 21, 27, even though both statutes were done at the same time, same year, same uh, modification time period. This, this gets back to Justice Johnson's initial observation. What happens to that Mississippi custody order? I mean, it's just what happens to it? If it's if an adoption's granted, yes, I mean it's it's still there, isn't it? It's still there. I think this supersedes because he is a party here, though he has notice here. He has been served properly uh, from Kansas. He can, uh, and Mississippi does not, by the way, does not have a statute uh, similar to Kansas with the two year. They do not have a two year no contact, no support. That is that is not correct. They do not. Say that again. Mississippi does not have a two-year statute like we have under 59-21-36. That is not, that is not uh, what they have. So he would not... So in Mississippi, besides the uh, residency of your client and all the other, um, uh, your client couldn't obtain an uh, adoption without consent? That's correct, Justice Mississippi. Johnson. That is correct, Justice Johnson. They wouldn't... They don't have any similar... I mean, not maybe not a two-year period, but they don't have any similar statute about a failure to provide support or um, being a grounds for termination of parental rights. Uh, they have no two-year. I, I believe they have something around the birth, like the six month we have, but I know they do not have any two-year, and I know that, that there is no a provision like that, and there, and there is no allegation we would fall under any six month um, of birth because the parties were married at the time. Uh, it was prior to the, the divorce that occurred between CH and uh, CM. What about filing for a termination? Can that be done in Mississippi by uh, your, either your client or his wife? I don't know the answer to that. Okay. I, I, like I their, their child in need of care type provision. I'm, okay. I, I mean, because that's really, this action is, as Justice Kaplinger, or excuse me, Moritz <laughs> pointed out, sorry, um, that, that this is a, 
a situation where you really have a dual proceeding, a, a termination and an adoption. Correct. So it, it seems to me the first step that has to happen, if anything has to happen in Mississippi, the first step is the termination. <laughs> The, problem, the only problem I would see, just looking at it from a Kansas point of view, would, uh -huh. there would be no jurisdiction for them to have it because the child is not a resident of the state of Kansas. I know from other sinks from other states, the first determination is where's that child the resident of, and if Mississippi is not that child's residence, but then it's it the, would. But it's the biological dad's residence. <clears throat> Correct. But I'm sorry, you're saying there'd be no jurisdiction in Mississippi for them to terminate the parental rights of this parent? Or I'm, 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 not, I'm not aware if Mississippi has a statute that allows them to terminate the rights of the parent if it outside of an adoption proceeding. Outside of an adoption okay. proceeding. That's kind of significant, though, isn't it? Because that's really what needs to happen here is his parental rights need to be terminated by whatever court has jurisdiction so you can proceed with the adoption in Kansas. Correct. So if that was a possibility, that really is... And, and, it, and, and we do have case law saying termination of parental rights is all about custody. I mean, that is what it is. It, it, it is a custody proceeding. So that might be appropriate there if their law allowed for that. And, and I can Terminate his parental rights, which is a custody proceeding in the very court that had custody, jurisdiction over the custody matters in the first instance. I think that the better procedure would have been for this judge to have called to Mississippi as provided under 59-21-27 to speak with the judge there versus summarily dismissing the case. So is your plan B that this was premature, at this, least premature? This was very premature, yes. Okay. yes. It, I mean, that's what, when, as I listen to your overall argument, it sounds like that's really your fallback position is if you're not entitled to... Um, Reversal for any other reason you were entitled to reversal because this was premature because the judge didn't take that step or permit you to put on evidence and that sort of thing. That that is correct. Okay, that is correct, thank Justice. you, counsel. I see you're out of time. Would you like about thirty seconds to wrap up? I just yes, your honor. Yeah, thank you. This child, every child, is entitled to a father. Every child <laughs> should have a mother and a father. This child has a father who has cared for this child here in Kansas to the and that is the father that wants to adopt this child it is not the father who's ignored this child for over a decade he is only asking this court for the ability to adopt this child and that is all the child wants is to have this father we'd ask that you overturn the lower court's decision Thank you, Counsel. Do you have any further questions for Counsel before he sits down? I see none. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you both for your arguments this morning. The Court will take this matter under advisement.